We're in a series about, um, about spiritual warfare, and we are in a fight, whether you recognize it or not. What you're seeing is not what's all that's going on. And maybe one day we'll crack the code and be able to have technology to get us to slip into the spiritual realm. I don't know. It'd be a good science fiction novel. Maybe I should write one. But right now there are all kinds of microwaves. There's TV and TV um, signals. There's AM signals. There's cell signals right now through the air, but you can't see it. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so often what we do is we fight the wrong battles. We fight against people. We fight against situations. But we have to recognize if we're really going to have victory in fighting against what's going on in our culture, we must understand that there's an air war taking place. In fact, what you need to do in any kind of military scenario is you first have to do is gather intelligence. And then after you gather intelligence, you begin to soften the targets by bombing them through strategic strategic surgical strikes, right, against the enemy, and then the ground troops can come in. We're the ground troops. And there are things going on in the heavenlies that, that, are, that you may not see, but it's really going on. And, and we mentioned this before, and I just want to give a little bit of a, uh, uh, just an understanding about it. We often fall into two camps. We either over-exaggerate the demons, there's a demon everywhere, as C.S. Lewis says, or we make nothing of the demons. And, and what's going on in the spiritual well, world. And the enemy is happy with both scenarios. The truth of the matter is God placed us here where he places you, he gives you the most authority. He's placed us in the physical world. So we are ground troops. We need to speak to God through prayer. We need to be aware of the enemy, but we're on a mission. And if we follow our commander in chief, if we listen to what God has called us to do because he's in the war room and we do what he's called us to do, we can have victory. Now, the good news is this. We've already won the war through Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he conquered both the power of sin and death. But right now we're in the mopping up operations between the war being won and being done. The decisive battle during World War II was D-Day. But it took at least a year before the war was completely over. We're in that incomplete time right now. And so I can tell you right now, the best is yet to come in Christ Jesus but we must know how to fight. Now, how many of you like shoes? Okay. All right. How many of you think shoes are important? How many of you are barefoot today? Okay. Well, you got to be careful, for example. Uh, yeah, you know, you want to be careful. Because if you walk barefoot, you could, like, hurt yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really important to have the right types of shoes. And, and I've been to the beach, and we went to the, uh, Marco Island in the middle of uh, July. Man, let me tell you right now, you'd fry an egg in that, in that sand. And so you walk in that sand, ow, 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 right? It's so hot, you have to wear your Crocs, and which is a Croc, right? So you have to do that as well. And so just to deal with the heat. And so you have to have your feet protected. So shoes are very important. Can I hear an amen from the ladies? Sneakers are important. Can I hear an amen from the guys? Amen. How many of you are sneakerheads? Okay, I'm not a sneakerhead. I'm boring. I did wear the same cut. Okay, anyhow. So here's a wear your shoes. You need to wear your shoes. And here's an example of someone's shoe collection. And very, we make a big deal of shoes in our culture. Uh, you know, all kinds of shoes for everything. For example, some of you like to go golfing. That's called golfing shoes. And you want to make sure you have the right types of shoes for the right attire. Another example would be this, right? How many of you, I mean, I'm sure each of us have these. These are called tap dancing shoes, right? So maybe we'll do that next week. So tap dancing shoes. This is specific. How many of you like your bowling shoes? Okay, I don't have any bowling shoes. And then you have cleats. This is really important. You have in football and baseball and, and soccer. You need to have your cleats because what happens is it holds you in line. If you're a linebacker and you don't have any good grip, you're going to be throwing it down. You need cleats to what? To spike into the ground, to have a grip, to be able to stand, to be able to do what you're called to do. And, of course, we all love uh, Pastor Tom is behind there. Pastor Tom, wave, everybody. There's our cowboy pastor behind there. He likes cowboy boots. Come on, give it up for Pastor Tom. <laughs> so if you don't know Pastor Tom, talk to him afterwards. Okay, but you have cowboy boots, right? So you have to wear the, ride the horse, you need cowboy boots. And then, of course, this is amazing. I was looking at sneakers and all that, and in fact, uh, these Air Jordans sold for $31,000. 
It's a, it's a crazy market out there. Now, check this out. You think that's something. These uh, shoes right here are an original Air Jordan that were worn by Michael, Gort, Michael Jordan in game two of 1998 NBA sold. Are you ready for this? $2.2 million for someone's sweat glands and dead sin, sin, skin cells on a normal, um, can you believe that? $2.2 million. And so there's a market out there for sneakers. You can apparently make a lot of money. You can buy sneakers and, and there's a whole industry out there. They're making thousands and thousands of dollars on sneakers and shoes. So a lot of us see the value of shoes. So how, what you wear is very important based upon what you're doing, right? So the Bible talks about shoes as well. In fact, some of you wear this. Can I just speak to the people that are, are not dating anyone? Don't wear these if you want to get a date. <laughs> if you're married, who cares? Okay, I'm just kidding. Don't wear that either. <laughs> but this is what the Romans guards would have. Roman soldiers, they had these, these um, sandals. They were like cleats, or the lack of a better term. And they were very strong. And what they would do, they'd, they'd put a sheet of metal sometimes and they would put spikes through it, nails, and they would cut them. And this is very important. What they would walk and they would, and they would trample against the enemy because what would happen was they had the minefields of their days. They didn't have minefields, but they put spikes under the ground and cover them up with dirt. And you'd walk on it. If you don't have a good sandal, that spear would go right through your foot. So the Roman soldiers learned how to have good armament. In fact, Alexander the Great, really, he was the one that really started employing the military sneakers, if you will, or the shoes, not sneakers, but shoes to have battle. It's very important. In fact, you can't go in the military if you have flat feet. Seriously, it's that important. Your feet are very important for warfare. And so these Roman guards, Roman soldiers would have these cleats. And the apostle Paul is writing this to us while he's chained to a Roman guard, undeniably looking at the Roman guard, probably coming with ideas for a sermon for his writings. And he uses this as an analogy to explain what's going on. So these were absolutely amazing. And you would march sometimes, a whole regiment would come together and march with the right armament that are on. So here's an example of what you can see. We spoke the very first week about the belt of truth. The belt of truth is very important. Remember, truth is not, not subjective, it's objective. There is something called absolute truth. Two plus two equals five. You all know that, right? What's well, my, I feel, my truth, two plus two equals five. No, no, there's truth. There's right and there's wrong. And God designed truth. In fact, God is truth. He cannot help but be true. And so we spoke about that. The belt of truth is very important. How do you hold all your armament together? You have to put the belt of truth on first. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you know a lie, it will keep you in bondage. So very important we understand that. So what we're going to do right now is read the basic passage of Scripture, which we're launching this entire part of the series on, about the reality of the life you and I live and what is going on in our lives. Okay, you guys ready? All right, here we go. Finally, be strong in yourself. Be strong in what? In the Lord. I will boast in God. You see, all of us are designed to be confident and well position people. And the only way you can truly do it in the right way is if you are, you are confident in who you are in God and you're humble about it, but you're confident. So finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, like a sailboat at sea that hoists its sails to catch the wind to propel it forward. So you and I need that as well. It's the strength of God. So in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor. This is a command. Put on the whole armor. If you're going to be part of a Roman soldier, you need to put on all the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Yes, there is a devil out there. I doubt he messes with you and I. 
but he's like the commander-in-chief of what's evil in the world. If you don't think there's a devil out there, all you have to do is see the heinous and horrible things that are going on in our culture today around the world. It's unbelievable how evil is is progressing in a very bad way, but God has us here to make a change in that. So against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, right? Against the spiritual forces of evil in the what? Heavenly places, not in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. He tells us again, take up. And there's six pieces of armament. He takes the first three you're supposed to take up, and the last three you're supposed to put on when necessary. So take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. You and I can be overcomers. We can withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. So sometimes all you need to do is just stand. Do not get yourself go the wrong direction. Martin Luther, the church reformer, said, here I am, here I stand. When they were challenging him. You have to sometimes just stand. And I will not back down. We have to stand. When we see stuff in our culture that is damaging people, we need to stand. I said, I'm going to stand for what's right in the school system. I'm going to stand for what's right in my town. Don't be a jerk about it, but stand with what? With reverence, but I'm going to stand anyhow. You have to stand. Don't be intimidated. Don't be bowled over. I'm going to stand. This is where I stand with my family and I. We're standing here and we're not moving. Let me give you an example how I stood this past couple of weeks. I tell you, my mother's been, my mother's really struggling with her health right now. And um, she's been going to rehabs and all that. Some of these rehabs are like prisons. Horrible, right? So they want to take my mother from the wheelchair to the bed. And these, these guards come in. Uh, they call them healthcare professionals. They're guards. They said, you need to leave the room. I said, I'm not leaving the room. I'm staying right here. You have to go. I'm getting my supervisor. I don't care. I'm staying right here. You want to touch my mother? I'm going to be right here. I'm going to see what you do. And they're rough with my mother. You know, she'd say, okay, we're going to move you to the right. Three, two, one. They're just like a rack. I said, what do you think you're doing? I got in trouble. Listen, I'm going to stand. God doesn't call us to be wimps. We should stand up for our kids. In fact, I'm going to embarrass somebody in my family, but I remember, never forget one time Luke was on the school bus and this kid was making fun of his, his sister Hannah and Luke punched him in the face and broke his glasses. Can I hear an amen? Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, sorry. That's violent. No, it's godly. If someone beats up on your sister, take them out. In the biblical sense. <laughs> But seriously, guys, what's all this man be paying? I'm a Christian. No, be a man, be a woman, stand for what's right. But don't be a jerk about it. And that's hard for me not to do because I'm Italian, okay? (laughs) Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand firm, stand. What do you think he wants us to do? Stand, right? Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as the shoes for your feet and having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace and all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication To that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, which is plural. So listen, if you're going to be a Roman soldier, you're not much good without an army about and around you. You see, God's calling us not to be individualized only. But in order to be a soldier, that means you're part of an army. You're part of a regiment. You're part of a platoon. Are Are you a soldier? Do you have your armament on? Are you all by yourself? If you're all by yourself, you're going to get picked off. We need to join together as in unity, helping each other. Stand together. We're talking about in the coming weeks. We stand together. We watch each other. Because I can't see what's in back of me. But if I have two or three brothers with me, at least, they can keep an eye on what's going on. You need to be connected to other people. It's very important. The only way this works, Christianity is not an individual sport. It is a team effort. 
You're responsible for how you play on the field, but you can't win without Jesus and the team. Are you connected? Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to be down one day and say, you know what, I'm tired of this. You need someone to say, I noticed you've been kind of down lately. I noticed your attitude's been not been right. I have noticed you have to return my text messages. I noticed it. What's going on in your life? You need someone to tell you when you say, I want to leave her or leave him. You say, no, you don't. no, you're not going to do that. You made a commitment. You need someone to tell you when you feel like you want to drink or do drugs or steal. Someone can tell you, no, 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 you're not called to do that. You're better than that, my friend. When you feel like giving up on life, you need someone to tell you it's going to get better. The sun will come out tomorrow. And finally it did today. Amen. Right? So you need a team. And this is what's so important. This is why we have small groups. This is why we have encourage you. This is not the answer. What's the answer is getting together with brothers and sisters in the Lord. And this is an excuse to get to know other people that you and I can fight the battle that's set before us. But if you're all by yourself, you're going to get picked off like a zebra in the Serengeti. You need to come together as a pack. The zebras will kick together against the lions. But if it's by itself, it's going to be prey. And so the enemy is preying on you, so you and I need to stand up and put on the armor and march together, and we can make a difference in our culture and our land. So I would encourage you to get involved. If we don't have something here, look online. We have extra things online. If we don't have anything that works with your schedule, tell us, and we'll make a small group for you. I'm serious. It's that important. Get connected. And what begins to happen is you're in the parking lot or the driveway of someone's house afterwards, and then the real conversation happens. You're like, I don't know if I can take it anymore. I don't, I don't know. I'm depressed. I'm down. I had enough of her. I had enough of him. Or I, I told the Lord this was the last time, and I did it again. If anyone ever knew what I did, I'd be done. You need somebody you can speak to and take off the mask and be real. If you're going to be a soldier, that's what you need. That's why we have small groups to help foster. Now, you don't tell everyone everything. You find a trusted brother or sister. And one of the things I have passion for is for men to, to get real with each other and be strong. Blood-stained allies. That's why we have some men's groups that meet on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. Anywhere from 40 to 60 guys meet there. We have the you know, Wednesday evening, Friday morning. And we want to get more and more men. Why just the men? Because the men have been isolated. You ladies are good at getting together. Us men, we're kind of hard-headed. And we need to gather together. So how do we do that? For perseverance. Making supplication for the saints. So I want to encourage you guys, at, not right now, but after, get signed up. And if you don't, you don't have to go there for life. If you don't like it, don't go back. Seriously, it's okay. it's okay. But get involved. It's important to get connected. The only way you can live this life. If you're a baseball player, you need to be a part of a team. If you're a football player, you need to be part of a team. If you're part of the army of God, you need to, you need to be part of the army of God, not by yourself. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you so much. And so today we're talking about this. And the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You know what the gospel means? In Koine or Greek, it's barely used. It means it's so good, it can't get any better. I rarely ever give anything, any awards, and I never see a movie that's perfect, right? There's always something that could be better. No, this is what talking about. Gospel is so good, it's hard to believe it's so good. The gospel of peace. Peace means tranquility during hostility. Tranquility during hostility. Anyone can have peace on the beach. If you are in, if you're in some of the Fiji islands, drinking Fiji water on, a, on an umbrella, and you got, the, you got the beautiful sunlight on you, anyone can have peace there. The bills are paid. Oh, that's fantastic, right? Everything's going great. But when your mother's in the hospital, not quite sure she's going to live. When you have a health issue, and this is not me, but you don't know what's going to happen. When things are going bad and people are losing their jobs and you think you might be next, that, that, that's the heart. That's when really the peace is necessary. That's when you know you really can get peace or not. Peace is a state of being, but God says this, my peace I give to you. It's the gospel of peace. And what's that? That's the shoes. This is how you and I can stand in the middle of the storm. I, I'm, I'm going to stand. I'm going to move forward. What, are the, what does the gospel of peace do? Wear your shoes of peace. Look at your neighbor and say, wear your shoes of peace. Crocs will work. Okay. And so this is a picture of me a couple summers ago. 
<laughs> was a gladiator. You see, you know, they, they have, I mean, all the different armament. You can see that when they were at war, not only do they have the cleats, but they put like these shin guards on that connect it to the cleats. So they can take, how many of you ever get kicked in the shins? It's hard to grin when you get kicked in the shin. <laughs> I can't help it. I rhyme and I can't, it's, it's, I rhyme and it's no crime. Okay, so when you have the belt of truth, we talked about that already, different armaments. And then today, we're talking today about the shoes, the gospel of peace. And you can see how important it is. And what they would do is they would, they would march together. You Roman guards, Roman army would come next to you. They would march and the enemy would be right there. You know what happened if they pushed the enemy down? Guess what they would do? They'd trample on the enemy. Just trample on the enemy. The whole regiment would go over the enemy, crush them with their cleats. Those spikes would go into them and kill them. How violent. But this is what it was going on. This is what the apostle Paul, this is what they did. Okay, this is a spiritual illustration, obviously. And so it's so important to put on the gospel of peace. This is what they would wear. How do you put it on? How do you put it on? Shoes provide stability and mobility for the soldier. Stability, right, and mobility. So you're ready to act. I need to have the peace of God in me. When you enter a room, what happens? What do you bring when, you, when people meet you? Do you bring anxiety, negativity, or do you bring peace? You see, God wants us to bring peace. Peace is not the absence of difficulty. Peace is peace in the middle of the storm. In fact, I heard of a, uh, I heard of a uh, owner commission a couple of artists. I want you to draw me a portrait of peace. And so the first guy did an amazing portrait of a beach scene with a beautiful trees or not a, 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 around a beach, around a lake. It was gorgeous. The sun was coming out. There were birds flying. It was gorgeous. And then the other guy that did the portrait, he had this sea with a lighthouse and they had these, these roaring waves and it was lightning in the distance and all that. And it looked anything but peace. But at the very corner of the painting on the island, there was a little tree and there was a beam of light coming from the sky where the, where the storm was going away and there was a bird singing on the branch. That's the peace. That I can sing in the middle of the storm, no matter how bad it is, I have peace. Now, I'm going to use an illustration I used a couple of weeks ago, but it's been really fascinating. I, there was a situation one time I was in a foreign country and I had to leave or I'd be arrested and thrown into jail. I'm not making this up. And I had peace the whole time. And I don't know why I had peace. And then I came back and I had to take a Greek test and I was anxious. But it's interesting. And it, or even my own children heard me say this. I was praying and my dad and I were on the phone. And I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, my mother, we're not quite sure what's going to happen to her. And, and I was crying. I know we don't cry except for Hallmark commercials. And, um, and I was crying in front of my children, and I, and I said, you know what, Dad, it's amazing. While I'm crying, and I'm, I'm, I'm weeping, and I'm wailing a little bit, I feel peace and joy in the midst of it. Because I know where Mom is, I know she's called by God, and I know we win in the end. I know who won the Super Bowl. If it's the Kansas City Chiefs, I'm not going to be very happy. But that's beside the point. But this is what, we know who won already. But right now, it's a little tough, but we know who won the game. The anxiety of the Super Bowl of your soul has been won by Jesus. He already has the rings and everything. He's got the trophy already, but we're in that in-between time. Shoes provide stability and mobility for the soldier. The stable soldier can stand firm when the enemy attacks. I got peace. I got peace. How you doing? It's rough but I'm standing. I'm standing. What are you standing on? I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm not standing on some wishful thinking. I'm standing in my position in Christ. What does that mean? Well, here it is. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be what? Steadfast and immovable. Immovable. Don't move. Don't be, don't be a wimp. Don't stand down. Stand up. Don't give in to your feelings of, that are wrong. Don't give in to the temptation. No, stand. Be a man. Be a woman. Stand up. Stop being a wimpy Christian. There's no such thing as a wimpy Christian. If you're in Christ, you're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. We've got to be tough and stand. Don't give up, right? Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain for the Lord. When you stand and you do the right thing, you may fail down here, but in heaven you win. And that's what really matters. Everything here is temporary. So what is this peace? Peace is a weapon. Peace is a weapon. 
You see, calm and tranquility of soul amid difficult circumstances. I just told you about that painting, how that bird could sing in the middle of the storm. Can you sing in the middle of a storm? Can you say, I, though he crushed, though he slay me, I will trust him. Can you believe the apostle Paul struck down, but not destroyed, suffering, but joyful in despair, but having hope. We should be prisoners of hope, as the Bible says. That I am locked up, I'm incarcerated in joy, and I will not be let out of the prison of hope. I had the chains of his promises, and no matter what happens, it's gonna be okay. Peace should be the default of the believer. Now, before you start here, I will have an anxiety problem. I get it, everybody. We're not suggesting, this is not condemnation. We understand that we live in a difficult place and sometimes anxiety and depression hits us. It's the number one medication, according to what I read in America today, is antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. I understand that. Is it bad to be on it? If you need it, you need it, praise God. But if you're a diabetic, you don't need to have fudge rounds and Twinkies and devil dogs, especially the devil dogs. Angel food cake is okay, but not devil dogs. If you're having bacon and grease and all that, and you're eating all this trash, of course you have diabetes, but if you change your, your, your diet and eat tofu and have all this horrible bird food, you'll be healthy. I'd rather die. Anyhow, that's beside the point. <laughs> peace should be the default of the believer. So I have peace in God. And though I'm going through a hard time, I have peace. I'm struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I'm going through a hard time, but I know better days are coming. You, you follow me, everybody. Okay? It doesn't mean that you're not going to be perfect all the time. Okay? You need peace when things are tough. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It will guard your heart and your mind. How do you do that? You are thankful. Thank you, God, that no matter how bad things are going, the best is yet to come. I told my mother when she could barely talk, Mom, the best days are ahead in Christ Jesus. You can believe it, Mom. The best is yet to come. And I tell people that in hospice for years, because if you're in Christ, the best is yet to come. This is only a womb, and eternity is so much better. Peace is what I have because Jesus lives in me. Let me give you an example. If you're in a submarine, right? If you're in a submarine, you are in the ocean, under the water, but you have a different environment. In fact, I, I was reading this past week in preparation for this about fish and mammals. You know fish, right? Fish or fish. Fish or fishy. Fish are you know, usually cold-blooded. Whatever the environment is, they take on. They're slimy and they're fish. They're stupid too. That's why we have to eat them, okay? They're, they're stupid. They're dumb. But you know, there's something else called mammals. And those are like whales and dolphins. They're smart, and what happens is they're in the ocean, but not of the ocean. They live in a different environment. They, they're not controlled. Though they may be cold in the environment, they go to the top and they blow out the toxicity and they breathe in the heavens of another planet, another part of our planet, and they go down into the depths of the sea and they can live because they're in a different environment. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to be above, I, I'm, I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. And so I also read this, that during a storm, it could be a horrible hurricane on top of the water. And so if you're at five feet below, it's still there. But if you go 25 to 26 feet below the storm, it becomes tranquil. So when you're going through a hard time, it's time to go deep. It's time to go deep. It's time to fill those tanks with faith and submerge into the promises of God and stand in a different environment. I'm going to bear, I'm going to weather the storm because I'm going deep in the promises of God, which are yes and amen. amen. That's what we have to do. So peace is what I have because Jesus lives in me. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once or far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He's our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. The gospel message is this simple. All of us are a complete wreck. If you think you have your act together, no, you don't. None of us do. 
All of us make tremendous mistakes. It's only by the grace of God any of us can stand. As you receive the grace and listen to God and, and, and do not live voluntarily in sin, but say, I, I want to do better. Watch what God can do through your life and my life. This is what Jesus says. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God gives us peace. Right now, my wife's under a lot of pain. She has to take Percocet and ketamine. No, I'm just kidding. She's not taking ketamine. But she's taking all these medication, and she doesn't like it. It makes her fear strange, right? But the problem with the pain medication, it's, all it's doing is masking a problem and making you feel like it's okay. And so maybe you can pop a pill in this world, get drunk or get involved with sports or get involved with some gambling or something to, or, or, or involved with some relationship to help you forget the pain, but the pain is still there because there's a problem. Jesus doesn't just take away the pain. He heals the wound that causes the pain and you can stand in his name. So Jesus is not a painkiller. He is a pain healer and makes you whole. So why do I want to inebriate myself when I have to wake up to more pain. That's why alcohol and drugs doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's a temporary fix for, for more destruction and more difficulty. Do not let your heart be troubled, all right? Neither let it be afraid. We have to say, I'm not gonna let it be troubled. Can I be truthful with you for a few seconds? I, I've had some people pray for me, not in this church. And when they pray for me, I actually feel worse. Oh, Lord, we know the pastor's going through a hard time. The devil's attacking him. Lord, you know, the, you know what's going on with the economy. They might lose the, the, the whole economy might crash. There might be World War III. Lord, you know that cancer happens in about 30% of the people in the United States of America. We know that cancer runs in our society, and he drinks all these toxins and lives in toxic air. We know that he might have cancer one day. And, Lord, we know that relationships fail at least 50%. So, I mean, and so, Lord, we pray right now. I don't want to hear that. Pray faith not lies. Don't let your heart be troubled. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called and be thankful. Here's the Apostle Paul. For I consider that sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. A lot of people complain. When I go to heaven, I'm going to ask God a lot of questions. God, why did my great aunt die? God, why did I experience this in my life? Why did I go through that horrible cancer of that person? And you have all these questions, and all you have to do is read the book of Job. In the book of Job, there was a lot of questions going around with Job. And all that had to happen at the end of Job is God showed up, his presence. And Job goes, I got no more questions. I get it. When we go to heaven one day, his presence is the answer. You go into a different way of understanding. It's beyond information. It's transformation through his presence. It's not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things where we are what? We're more than conquerors through what? Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, my friends, in Christ is the truth. And God will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Peace is what I make because Jesus works through me. The Bible says if it's possible, live at peace with all people. The Bible says blessed are the peacemakers. Do you bring peace where you go or do you bring hostility? In the break room, do you come and make it better or do you, or you let out a negative bomb? What happens when you walk into a place? You know, George Washington Carver had a rough time. He was born into slavery. His parents were, 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 were um, kidnapped he grew up in a very hostile time. Yet this man had a deep faith in God and did not get bitter, he got better. And he let the peace of God bring him just to, to rise above the ocean of this world. He was a mammal who understand a different atmosphere. And this is what he said. God cannot use you as he wishes until you come into fullness of his glory. Do not get alarmed, my friend, when doubts creep in. 
That is old Satan. Pray, pray, pray. Listen, we all go through doubts. But be like George Washington Carver, who could have had a bunch of excuses why he couldn't rise. He became one of the greatest scientists of the last century in regards to agriculture. So don't let it stop you. You won't find peace until you or make peace with God. Have you made peace with God? And so we're, we're running a little low on time here, but shalom, we often say in the Jewish culture, it means peace, prosperity, fullness. God wants you to have peace. Be still. I am God. And so we can live in that peace that God has for us. Since peace lives within me, I can establish peace around me. Now here's an evangelist of pig. You heard of pig pen, right? He has an environment of dust. When you enter a room, what do you bring? Do you bring peace? Or I can't believe what's going on. Or do you continue to talk about what's going on in the news? Or do you bring peace? What happens in your life? Do you bring peace? So, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. You realize you can go to work and speak peace. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up. You can speak peace into your workplace. In Jesus' name, as you pull up in the driveway, Father, I ask peace to be upon this household. Lord, I pray peace in this classroom. I pray peace in this courtroom. I declare the kingdom of heaven is here. I am an ambassador of God, and I invite the presence of God. I invite the Prince of Peace to come in. And you can speak peace. We can bless each other in Jesus' name. That's a beautiful thing that we can do, everybody. Wear your shoes of peace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that we get to make a difference together. Lord, I thank you that you've made us ambassadors of heaven for those that have given our lives to Christ. Can we just, if you feel comfortable, just lift your hands for a second. Lord, I just pray that your peace would reign on everyone here. Lord, in this troubled time, Lord, we thank you that you are our peace. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd rest upon everyone right now. Peace be still and know that I am God. Thank you that we had the victory through the Jesus Christ. I command fear and anxiety and worry to go. Lord, we choose to believe what your word says over our thoughts and our feelings in Jesus' name. Amen.